This is what we are. We are all I am. It is. Well, hi, uh, I'm Paolo Garcia, one of the founders of Domestic Streamers. Today I'm also a donut. Um, and I will talk about domestic data, what we do in domestic and why we do it, because some, sometimes when we explain it, it's a bit surrealistic. But first of all, I want to introduce some facts. Um, this is one of them. We saw this tweet from Intel uh, two years ago. And it was saying that by 2020, more digital data will exist on Earth than stars in the known universe. And that fact really blown our mind and, and was interesting because it was such a beautiful metaphor of the time we're living today as, as the mankind has been telling stories through these stars, through these constellations during the, these, two, these 2,000 years, these last 2,000 years. And now we, we can do the same again, but with new universe of data. Again, uh, we are able to see these facts in, for example, The Guardian, two years ago, 90% of world's data has been generated over the last two years. And what does it mean? It means a lot of things. It means that the world is changing very fast, but it also means that almost the totality of the information that we are transforming, that is being born, that we are understanding today, is born in a total digital environment. And our question is if this digital environment is the best one to really understand what this data means. Because uh, when you write data on Google, you see all these images. This is what Google understands as data. And, and we really don't relate data to that. At the end, data is talking about nature, it's talking about society, it's talking about ourselves. And what we want to do is transform this image that we got over this uh, term, data. Now I want you all to think on, on this image, a uh, newborn baby, this very emo emotional fact, this very emotional event. Humans are able to transform such an, emo an emotional event into numbers. And we create these symbols to understand more complex, uh, more quantitative realities. But by doing so, we are transforming all these symbols into a, a big distance between their reality thousands of newborns, and our perceived reality, a number. Our work is mainly focused in stretching this, this distance between these two realities. But the tools that we have today is, uh, are not that long. As, we, as you can see here, we are using the same tools that we were using in well, 1781. And what we try to challenge is the way we understand data visualization tools and data meaning tools. Uh, I will explain three examples, simple examples that we have done during the last two years of work. Uh, this is called Lifeline and uh, was the answer to a question that we got about um, when the people want to die, actually. So the way actually uh, data sets work or the way we think in databases is, is like raw data. In, like an Excel sheet. And, and here you can see all the data. We ask people about their real age, and we ask people until what they, they would like to live for. And, and we got all this database on that, that is not really easy to understand. Then you can change it, you can transform into a, a standard infographic. As you, as you can see here, uh, children, like this axis over here is, is for the real age of the people, and, and the axis, uh, the vertical axis is talking about the age that people want to die. As you can see, these are the principal clusters of each age, as, uh, and, and children mostly want to die on 120, 140, <laughs> and as they grow up, they become more realistic, and, and they understand how our hospitals work, and, and yeah, they establish more in the 80s, 90s. And there is this little cluster on the 20s, people that want to, to die with 27 years old, like Jimi Hendrix, Jamie Wajas, this is an actual trend. But still, understanding the, all this information is, is something that is challenging us to, to think in different ways. So that's why we don't think in infographics anymore, but uh, in info experience, in how we can transform all this data, all this information, and all the transcendence that it has into something more meaningful. And now you will see the video of the installation that we did using the same data. In life, there are things which we are able to decide and others which we can't. Death is one of those things that plays between these two possibilities. 
where one can decide when to die, but not for how long they will live for. 800 balloons mark the point between one's real age and the age at which they would like to die in contrast with their gender. The white balloons are the coordinates of those who don't know at what age they want to die. Whereas the black balloons are the coordinates of those who do know at what age they want to die. A volatile and ephemeral peace that questions our desire to live and an irrefutable end of a journey. Or in other words, a lifeline. Well, actually, this was a, a tough experiment, asking questions like when you want to die to random people was like a uh, first quite bad impression, but, but the experiment went quite well. And we had like up to 2,000 interactions with people and, and what we could learn from this experiment were several things. The first one was that changing the way we were showcasing this information was totally changing the way people was going to read this information from this very individual way of reading that we got in our mobile phones, using our laptops, to a, a collective way. Just displaying this, this information in a three-dimensional space, we're not just making a space of display, but uh, making a space of discussion, of conversations, where the people could compare, compare themselves to the others. The other big switch that we got was um, changing this idea of, of of this monologue of information as, as most of the data visualization is specifically designed to create an impact on the audience. And uh, in this case, we were trying to make the audience make an impact over, data over the data visualization. So we are trying to create this dialogue between the information displayed and the people itself. And this was all possible because the, because the context. If you stop someone random in the middle of the street and ask for when they want to die, probably they will not answer the question. But if you ask that in the right environment, crossing all the different facts that you need, then you can have all this information. Another experiment we did, this is the first one we did, uh, is called the mood test. And we have been doing this experiment uh, for three years now. And mainly, it was uh, hosted in a, in a square here in Barcelona, in parallel. Um, it's, called, it's called the, the Square of Las Tres Chamanellas. And it's interesting because it has like a, a very plural community of people passing by. And it has like a public school, it has the blocks, the, a luxury hotel, the polo club, uh, public school, private school. So it has like all kind of, of, of different people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different religions even. And all of them were crossed there. And we wanted to create something that could kind of interact with all of them and show like the diversity of the space, but in a unified way. So we start thinking how we could ask people questions and which kind of questions could engage in a, in a deeper way. And what we tried at this, time, at this point, what we developed was uh, this timeline on a wall, uh, 24, hours, 24 hours timeline where that we spent in front of this wall, asking to all the people that was passing by uh, their age, and if they will, were feeling optimist or pessimist, something quite simple. And by the end of the day, we, could knew, we, we knew actually that the, the, most of the grannies of the morning are much more pessimist than the grannies on the afternoon. Uh, specific facts like, uh, like, like this one, but the most important for us was seeing how the people were starting to relate themselves to this wall. That was uh, a space for just showcase, where normally we're used to paint graffiti artists or um, illustrators, and this time were the, the, the people from the street, the people from the square, the people from the neighborhood that were creating the artwork. And we spent like the... the the day after the installation, we spent some time there just taking the pictures, and we noticed two girls, two little girls that were with their mother, and they just arrived there and say, hey, this circle is me. And at this point, we were like super happy because they were 
uh, having ownership of, of this public space. There was a, a strong connection between um, these people and the space that we had created. And, and the wall was not, an, and not anymore a space of, of just showcase, but a kind of mirror of what was happening in front of it. The last example that uh, I want to show you is called Sandfalls, and, and actually was, was a, um, a project that we were asked for the CCCB Museum here in Barcelona um, to kind of quantify the impact that an artwork, artwork can have over uh, an exhibition uh, and over the audience of an exhibition. And an artwork or art is something quite complicated to quantify. Uh, uh, because at the end it's subjective. But what we could quantify was the time that people was spending in front of one artwork or the other. So what we did was place different Kinect sensors and start taking all this information, information related to the sex, uh, information related to the amount of time that people was spending looking straight to one artwork or the others. And we are tracking all this information, and, and we could know exactly how the people was moving around the, around the exhibition. But what was more important for us is how we could change the, behavior, the behavior of people, not just showcasing and displaying information, but how can actually data visualization change the, the human behavior. So that's why we built up an installation that was placed at the end of the exhibition uh, that was actually visualizing the track of five different artworks. And in real time, these sand clocks were showcasing the, the, the amount of time that each visitor were spending in front of these five different artworks. So at the end, when the people arrived to this last installation, and they could see and they could understand the, the amount of time that most of the audience had spent in front of these five different artworks, they came back again to see these five artworks with this new layer of information. And, and while there is this fun story about, about this installation, it was like one of the first major uh, projects that we did, and, and we were a bit afraid. And, and the day of the opening, we just came there like really early to see that everything was going well. And, and there was already some, some sand that was on the... On the on the clocks, and we were like, oh, we screw up, it's not working well. But later on, we discover that what the sun clocks have been tracking was not the audience, because there was not audience during the night, but was the, the cleaning personnel of the exhibition. So we could also track which parts of the exhibition were better cleaned. It's <laughs> like a multifunctional installation. And, but most important, it was able to change the behavior of people inside an exhibition space. And, and now talking again about this big data revolution, how we understand data today. And actually, like, we can see that there is films talking about big data, uh, TV series talking about big data, books talking about big data, and, and what is data, and is data the new God? All these questions are rising. And there is a, a huge amount of investment, both in talent and money, in, in understanding how data works and what we can get from it. But there is not the, the same amount of, of, of talent and money invested in how we will explain all, all this research to the people. And, and this is all about transcendence, from literature to arts to cinema and television to the most important uh, contemporary facts. All of them have transcended, no, because what they were, but because how they were explained to the people. And this is what we try to, to explain always. And, and there is this quote that is quite had that says that one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is just a statistic, and that's, that's quite right. And uh, six years ago, I had the opportunity to, to went to Birkenau, to the concentration camp in Auschwitz, and now is a, a museum of the Holocaust. Still, for me, it was like a great example of this same quote, uh, because there is a, an exhibition space, a huge room that is filled with, with hair, of the last thousands of victims. And when you stare in front of this, of this glass room, you forget about all the books, about all the numbers, about all the films that you have seen beho before, because these material numbers transcend much more. 
we don't have to be like that dramatic to, to talk about numbers and, and the importance of them. But for example, this is another example that, that we can find in nature itself. We have here in, in Catalonia uh, a space, well, a, a lake that is called the Pantà de Sau. And when I was uh, a child, I, just, you, I, I was used to pass by when I went to the village. And, and every time I passed by, I just took my, my, my head out of the window to see the, the lake, because you could read the weather through this, the surface of, of, the, of the lake. Now, when you think about how you read the forecast weather, you think about these kind of maps or either whatever application that we had today, but for me, children of four or five years old, the most important fact was discharge this in the middle of the lake. And depending on the year, depending on the rains, you can see it that is raising or this over the lake. And again, this was an important thing for us to understand, that we only truly understand something when we can relate it to something we already understand. How we explain things, how we explain facts, how we explain information today have to be in a very transcendent way. And it has a lot to be with humor. This is an example. These two guys, we met them in, in California, Venice Beach, and actually they were asking for money, but not for money. They were asking which religion cares most about the homeless. <laughs> the people were just making cues to give the money. Uh, and again, they were creating a dialogue between people. They were just making a visualization of all this information and making it in a very transparent way. And again, there was a, a change on the behavior of people. So this is the kind of visualizations that we are working today. When we talk about uh, visualization, we don't talk about infographics anymore. We work on tools in, in how these tools we, we do today and we build today that can be, can be whatever, whatever material, can be software, can be anything. All these tools will change the way we will understand the world tomorrow. So that's why it's important and transcendent every time we design a tool to visualize the information and to share it, to think it thoughtfully. Thank you very much.